I'm happy to introduce Joshua Ginsberg. He's chief architect at Social Code, and he's going to be talking about Redis. Hi. Um, my name is Joshua Ginsberg. Uh, I work with a company called Social Code. Uh, we're basically a full service social media advertising agency using data and analytics to drive performance marketing. I apologize if you have a buzzword allergy. Uh, our, our clients are mostly consumer facing Fortune 1000, uh, Amex, Coca Cola, and our parent company, The Washington Post. Uh, and we've had tremendous success using Redis as a uh, as a mix into our uh, technology stack, and I wanted to uh, introduce some of the ways to do it. So uh, we're gonna talk about what Redis is and what basically it does, uh, some good ideas on how to use Redis, some bad ideas on how to use Redis, uh, some very easy out of the box, no coding required ways to drop Redis into your project, and then how to do some more custom applications with Redis, going from the very sensible to the nearly psychotic. Um, so what is Redis? Redis is an absurdly fast in-memory data store relating keys to simple objects. So there's really three parts to that. It's absurdly fast. Um, on an M1 small instance, I can benchmark it at 20,000 requests a second. Um, it's entirely in-memory. So while your data store is durable to disk, uh, your data set does have to fit entirely within the system memory. And what it stores is keys related to objects. And these are simple primitives like we have in Python, uh, lists, sets, uh, dictionaries, strings, integers, and, and a, a type which doesn't exist in Python, uh, scored sets. Um, I'm a sysadmin by background, so I think understanding a tool is equally important to understand what isn't the tool. So what isn't Redis? Well, it's not SQL. Um, you interact with Redis through uh, defined atomic operations through its API. Um, so it's NoSQL, but it's not really what you think of when you think of NoSQL. If you've used Mongo, Couch, Cassandra, something like that, uh, Redis is very different. So the data structures are limited. Uh, and more than that, they're not nestable. Uh, so you can't have a multi-dimensional data uh, 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 value stored in Redis and have Redis understand what that means. And it doesn't lean on MapReduce. There aren't pre-programmed views. Uh, so it's way simpler than something like Mongo or Cassandra. But it's also not as simple as memcache. Um, it, it's not just a simple key value store. The operations that it provides through its API are much more complex, much more work can be done server side. Uh, so you get a much, uh, a much more flexible tool. Um, and this probably goes without saying, but it's not relational. So values can't themselves be other keys, but it can be referential. And we'll talk about a way that you can bring some of that into the mix. Um, okay, straw poll. Uh, who's used Redis, knows kind of what Redis is? Okay, a good deal of people. So I, I, I've got a crash course on what Redis is, so you at least understand some of the basic uh, uh, concepts there. Uh, uh, but uh, since it seems a lot of people have used it, I'll kind of go through it a little quicker. Um, I use the, the Python Redis bindings written by uh, Andy McCurdy. Uh, you can just pip install Redis and it's there. Uh, fantastic, well-written, very stable, and a lot of attention goes to it. Um, but so the first type of thing we can do in Redis is get and set very primitive strings uh, to, to, the, uh, to the database. Uh, it can also do integers. They're not really integers. Under the hood, Redis stores them as strings, but we get the addition of uh, atomic increment and decrement operations. Um, it also probably deserves mention that Redis doesn't care about character encoding. Everything's just a byte stream to it. Uh, but it's probably a good idea to use UTF-8, and most of the other software that uses Redis is probably making the same assumption. Um, then we have linked lists. These are very analogous to Python lists, uh, and they're great for ordered queues of information. And we have the same operations that you would expect on Python lists. You can push new elements into the list, you can check the length of it, you can slice the list, and Redis supports negative indexing the same way that Python does. Um, you can, it, they're mutable, so you can set individual elements within the list. Uh, and you can trim the list down to a particular size, which when combined with L push and L trim, it's a pattern that you'll see a lot, and we'll talk about that in a bit. But uh, for the most part, these operations are extremely efficient. So if you have an ordered queue of information, this is a fantastic way to store them. Uh, we also have sets. Um, again, exactly analogous to Python sets, and we have all the same operations you'd expect. The ability to add, the ability to check the cardinality of the set, uh, basic operations like uh, intersection, union, 
Um, and it's important to remember that like in Python sets, any element in the set can only exist once. So it doesn't matter how many times I stick Badger in there, we're only gonna get one element out of it. Um, and sets, based on their implementation, are also extremely efficient. Um, the type that we don't have in Python are scored sets. And these are exactly like sets, except each member of the set is associated with a floating point value nu numeric score. Uh, this could be a weight, this could be a count, this could be anything which is numeric, but what it does is it orders the set uh, based on the relative weights. So in addition to our normal set operations, you can increment the score atomically for any member in the scored set, but you can also uh, grab the first 10 elements sorted by score, or anything with a score less than a certain number. And on top of that, you can delete anything with a score greater or less than a certain number. Um, so time series data, epic seconds make a fantastic weight, counts of element frequency, uh, all these things are uh, very good for, for scored sets. Uh, and lastly, we have hash maps, which are basically exactly like Python dictionaries, and we have the same basic operations you expect, the ability to set keys, get keys, uh, get all the keys, get all the values, uh, equivalent to Python dictionary items. Uh, and like in Python dictionaries, uh, the key space is not ordered, so the order in which you set the keys isn't necessarily the order that you're gonna get them back out. So uh, that, that's it, that, that, that's Redis, I, I mean, it's so boring, um, which makes it interesting to try to fill a 40 minute talk with it. But if you think about it, like this is really cool and the possibilities are, are, are very broad because you now have an, a, a, a data store that all of your processes across all your web heads, all your workers and all your management boxes, they can all share. And they all map directly to primitive Python types. And Redis is implemented so quickly and the protocol is so minimal that it's, other than the, the very basic network overhead on a local network, it's not terribly slower. Um, it's basically a cache, and, and you should think of it not as a warehouse, not as storing for durable storage the way that we rely on SQL. SQL is fantastic at this. Uh, in most web applications, uh, the data that's the newest, the data that's talking about now, the data that's just been going in, tends to be the one that we ask a disproportionately high number of questions about. And when Redis can be used to take some of this load off the rest of your data systems, uh, it can be uh, extremely beneficial. And Django Core Cache, I mean, it's a very blunt instrument. Um, but you as the engineer know much more about your application logic, and so you can use Redis to write a much more surgical, much more intelligent caching strategy. But why not Memcache? Well, Memcache is dumb. Uh, it, it doesn't know anything about the types of data you're storing. It doesn't provide any real operations besides get, set, and delete. And so sometimes you want on your data store to have more rich operations, and Redis gives that to you. Also, memcache is very volatile. It doesn't commit anything to disk, and it has no problem ejecting records from your data store. So there are applications where memcache is a fantastic solution, but there are some definite advantages to Redis in, the, in terms of other operations. So let me just give you a case study. Um, in social code, we use Redis, and a uh, bit of a quick and dirty, uh, we run hundreds of thousands of ads on Facebook a day, and we have to query the Facebook API to snapshot their performance as fast as we possibly can. Now, I know for those of you that use the Facebook API, you're gonna be surprised to hear that there are parts of it that aren't terribly well documented, aren't terribly developer friendly, aren't terribly stable. Um, so we can't really ask them give me all the stats that have changed since the last time I asked. We have to get all of the stats for everything, and they don't update in real time, and they don't update at regular intervals. So we basically have to keep polling and polling and polling and look for any changes. Now, when we were only using MySQL for this, this meant we would get all of the stats down from Facebook and look row by row in MySQL, comparing what Facebook gave us to what we had in our database and updating or inserting if there was something new or newer. So we were doing SQL queries to individually select hundreds of thousands of rows out of 400 gigabyte, 1.2 billion row table. And yes, that sucks. Um, there isn't a more perfect use for Redis than this. We care about the most volatile, the most recent, the most current data. And so instead what we do is we take those most recent stats per ad group and store them as a hash map. Each Ad group gets its own key in the key space, and each one has its own hash, hash map with impressions and clicks and 
uh, the last time it was updated. And so when we go to the API and we get those, instead of going to SQL to ask our questions, we go straight to Redis. And Redis is tremendous at giving us single row answers. So we didn't have to go to the database nearly as often, and we didn't have to do uh, uh, conditional writes to the database based on new or updated information. And as a result, our IOPS dropped 90%. We went from doing almost 3 billion I.O. operations a month down to under 500 million in one month. Um, but in terms of a business, this meant that we could go to a smaller MySQL database. This meant that we could bring our worker farm down because we weren't doing nearly as many SQL queries. We had a bunch of C2 extra larges that we dropped down to C1 mediums. It meant that uh, our stats gathering loop time decreased, that we could get stats faster, which meant that we had more real-time actionable data to increase our profit margins. In terms of the, our systems cost, in terms of our business needs, this solution was a win all around. It's a dramatic solution, but you can get some benefit out of Redis just, again, with no code. Uh, Redis can power the Django caching backend. Uh, it's a third-party module. It's very easy to install, but uh, it's also pretty versatile. You can schedule all of your writes to a single Redis master. You can query from a pool of Redis slaves. Um, and versus memcache, it gives you, uh, again, that more power, the more uh, explicit ability to control your, your data set, and particularly with cache and validation, with ejecting keys. So with a Redis cache backend, you can do glob-style matching of your keys and eject any keys that match a particular pattern. Um, with memcache, you really don't have the same kind of flexibility. But by extension, this also means that you can use Redis to store your Django sessions and your Django messages. And again, when we're talking about the most volatile data, the stuff that's changing the most rapidly, this can take a lot of work off SQL. Uh, Celery is another fantastic place to drop it in. Uh, it's recommended, or at least it's documented in the, uh, the how-to on Celery that you use uh, RabbitMQ. Uh, personally, I think unless you can actually express a reason why you want to use RabbitMQ, you don't want to use RabbitMQ. Um, and a lot of people, when they realize that RabbitMQ is probably way more than they really need, they, they go back to uh, using the database as a broker and using it as a result store. But you can just as easily use Redis. With two simple configuration options, Redis is suddenly your broker, Redis is suddenly your result backend. And the backend actually has a couple of unique features to it. Um, one feature we use a lot are Celery cords. Uh, cords are where you have a set of tasks, and as soon as the entire set of tasks finishes, you have a callback. So on the other backends, you have to spawn another task, which sits there and monitors each of the parts of the task set and waits till they're done, and then fires the callback. Uh, with Redis and its atomic increment and decrement, as each task finishes, it just decrements a counter. So every task can tell you authoritatively whether it was the last one in the task set to run. At that point, it fires off the court. It's a little more efficient. Um, also, Redis has a pub sub messaging system, which we'll talk about in a minute, but um, for broadcasting Celery events about tasks starting and stopping and erroring, uh, pub sub is fantastic for it. And also, if you're using one of the more advanced features, the fan out exchanges where you send a message and all of the workers have to pick it up, uh, pub sub has a, is a good implementation for that also. But the, the common theme we have here is give SQL a break. And Redis is never going to replace SQL, but on that volatile, time-sensitive, the stuff that we are disproportionately querying with expensive queries that change every single time we go and get them, Redis is fantastic. So a lot of websites have a most recent comment, login, post, commit, whatever. Use a Redis list. Every time one of those happens, L push a new element onto the list, and L trim it down to the size that you want. So you can get the last 10 logins very easily. And you don't have to go to SQL to do it. Uh, if you're tracking some sort of time series data, you probably care about the most recent data first. Use a scored set. The data is highly volatile. You care about the most recent stuff. So you can get it based on, I want the first N. I want anything newer than this. And you can chop it off at anything older than anything you don't want. Counting. Um, Alex Clark uh, implemented pythonpackages.com. It's a cool site if you haven't seen it. But he tracks downloads that go through his site. And so every time somebody downloads something from Python packages, he has to increment a counter. Doing this in Redis is fantastic. You have an atomic in increment operation. Everything can have its own key. And every time a new download happens, you just pop the counter. No need to go to SQL. Some good ideas on how to use Redis. Um, you name your keys smartly. Uh, name your keys with hierarchy. Pick a delimiter. That's not going to occur anywhere else. 
and use that so that you can make your key space globable. Um, so that if, uh, it, w your keys are probably somehow hierarchically related. For us, if we want to get all of the ad groups in a campaign, we can say campaign colon colon ad group colon colon star. And we have them all. Uh, Redis has the ability to have n number of key spaces. They call them DBs, but it's basically just independent key spaces. Uh, use them. Um, there are a lot of times when you simply want to just flush all the data that an application has in Redis, but you want to be able to do that without touching any of your other applications. By giving each application its own key space, you can isolate which keys you want to do with that flush operation. Uh, use pipelining. Um, all of Redis's operations are atomic commands. Um, pipelining is a way to not only reduce TCP back and forth, so for large operations uh, is far more efficient, but it can also make atomic transactions so that you can basically lock the Redis database to run a series of commands um, all at once without, uh, without having introducing the possibility of a race condition. So for example, in this code snippet, we use pipelines to generate 10 random integers and push them into uh, a list, and then also using a pipeline, uh, pulling those back out. So we make the L push and the L pop commands there, but they don't actually get sent to Redis until we pipe execute. And when they go, all 10 commands go at the same time, and all 10 results come back at the same time. The tricky part of this means that you can't do a later operation based on the result of an earlier operation, because you're not going to get the result of that earlier operation until the same time that you're executing the later operation. Uh, serialization. So Redis can't store things more complex than those simple data types, and sometimes we want it to. Um, Storing complex records in Redis using JSON, YAML, Pickle, Protocol Buffer, whatever you want to use, uh, it, it has a time and a place. Um, it can be a great way to push a lot of complex data into Redis quickly, uh, but at the same time, if you're doing any sort of filtering operations based on the values within that structure, you're going to have to pull down your entire data set in order to filter it Python size. So it has a time and a place. Use it selectively. Uh, and the last suggestion is subclass for serialization, that the, the, the Python uh, Redis client itself y offers you the opportunity to hook in through callbacks and to override any of the individual operations. So for example, with a skeleton like this, uh, as a JSON Redis client that serialized all of the information going into Redis into JSON, the developer doesn't even have to know that you're doing that, because anything going in through the list operation gets serialized, and anything right before it comes out gets deserialized. Um, with the good ideas come the bad ideas. And, and the nice part is it's actually really hard to use Redis badly. Um, it's one of the advantages of it being such a simple system, but uh, one is don't store astronomically large values. Uh, Redis's performance declines fairly quickly, the larger the individual values that you store. Uh, so if you find yourself storing a megabyte as a value in Redis, it's probably time to start looking at something else. Um, don't design your schema so that you have to do a lot of round trips. Each round trip has a cost in the TCP IP overhead. And you know, like we said in the pipeline, that since you can't access the earlier values until the same time that you're accessing the later values, by designing your data differently, you can reduce the need to go get all of these, process this in Python, figure out what we want to get next, and then go get all of those. Um, one way to kind of mitigate this a bit is uh, it, it's fairly seldom used, but it's actually one of the coolest commands in Redis is sort. And you might think sort is boring, but sort actually does a lot more than sort. Uh, I had mentioned that Redis can be a little referential. Uh, within sort, if you can master the syntax, um, you can go and collect all of the keys that are listed at this particular key in this key's hash value. So you can look up all of the keys that match something, grab something out of the hash value, use that as additional keys to go and look up all in the, in a, at the same time. It's a cumbersome, cumbersome command, and it's really hard to learn the syntax. But if you can master it, then you can avoid some back and forth. Um, don't count on persistence. Uh, Redis does have persistence, and we'll talk about how to configure it. But I can't tell you how many people I know that have configured Redis with persistence and ended up losing their entire data space. Uh, it's actually hard to configure persistence correctly. So 
you can kind of count on it, but don't store anything mission critical you have in there that you're not storing somewhere else a little more durable. Uh, don't forget that op operations are atomic. Uh, it's really easy to introduce race conditions with Redis. Uh, using commands like pipeline and watch. Uh, watch looks to, won't execute a set of commands if during that time something else changes on a, on a key. Uh, you can avoid some of those race conditions. So consider carefully multiple operations that you're doing to make sure you don't introduce them because they are a pain to debug. Um, so let's have some fun. In Redis 2.6, they included Lua as an interpreter built into Redis. So you can write, store, execute Lua functions inside the Redis server, including looking up other keys in the Redis database. So you can use Lua's JSON interpreter, which suddenly means that you can JSONify values into Redis and then do lookups based on contents of that JSON. Uh, you can implement map reduces in very specific fashions. Uh, so for example, I could use this function to total up all of the clicks uh, in a given campaign. I, I do a, a blob-based search of my Redis keys for the set members and uh, gather the clicks and add them up and return it. So I could store this and it turns out to be about 60 to 80 percent faster than pulling it down to Python and doing it yourself. Um, but this is new as of 2.6. It's still something that uh, a lot of people are getting their head wrapped around. Um, so let's do something a little crazier. Uh, we can combine socket IO, G Unicorn, G Event, and Redis to implement real time push notifications. Meaning we can do this with dashboards. We can do this with writing a web based chat. We can do this for real time log monitoring. Anything where you're basically pulling messages off a message bus, uh, we can implement. And Redis includes uh, a pub sub system. Basically, you put a key into the key space, that is a channel and other clients can subscribe to it and publish to it, and it's just a messaging bus. Um, but when combining it with G-Event, G-Unicorn, and Socket.io, we can bring that into a web browser. So if you put Socket.io into one of your web pages, the, the code to hook it up is, is fairly straightforward. You point it to the right place, set up a new socket, and then set up an event handler for when a new message comes across the line. Uh, then you write a fairly simple Django view, it's a little complicated in that it uses a uh, G-event loop inside of it. Um, but uh, basically we hook up to the pub sub channel and for every client that connects, we subscribe to that channel. Uh, and for, uh, I went ahead and threw in here that uh, the, the client can push data back so we can listen on our open socket to the client in case they push a message into the bus and we can publish it. Uh, and then we uh, uh, basically listen for any data that comes across the wire and send it back down to the client. So when you wrap the WSGI server in Django, uh, suddenly you have a socket IO server where anybody can connect and any messages that come across that bus uh, suddenly get pushed down to a browser. Um, so for example, at, uh, at Social Code, one of the things we're looking into is that we have a dashboard of all of our campaigns running at a given time. And since we are collecting stats sporadically, when we gather new stats, we can automatically push notifications to all of the members of our staff that are looking at that dashboard, tell them to update, to go and uh, uh, refresh their information for the stats for a particular row. and makes your applications real time, which I think is one of the other buzzwords today. Um, now for full batshit crazy. Um, PostgreSQL 9 introduced a cool feature called foreign data wrappers. So uh, you can query other data stores in SQL and bring that together with information you have in Postgres. And so there's a very alpha uh, Redis foreign data wrapper. Uh, it only deals with simple Redis values, so only with the strings, not the list sets or hashes. But it's, it's kind of fun. Uh, I, you, I wouldn't recommend using it yet, but I, it, it's pretty cool. So you would define your Redis server in Postgres SQL. You would make a faux table uh, that connected to it, mapping the, the, the key and value. And then you could do a query if you wanted to figure out the number of times a particular user stored in one of your database logged in, you can join your user table to the Redis DB foreign table, uh, use a little concatenation to, to put your key together, and Postgres will join your Redis server to your Postgres SQL tables, uh, which saves you from having to do it uh, inside your application server. Like I said, batshit crazy. Don't do it, but it's possible. <laughs> 
Um, this talk wouldn't be fair without saying all the things I hate about Redis, because it, it's, it's not perfect. Um, Redis isn't durable the way you expect a database to be. Um, in Postgres and MySQL, when you hit commit, when it comes back and says, okay, especially if you're on EBS, you trust that, yes, this is there, and I'm always going to be able to get it back. Um, Redis offers two different options for durability, and you don't have to use durability. You don't have to write to disk ever, but you can. Um, one of them is point-in-time snapshots, and they call this RDB. Um, it's fantastic for full backups, because you very quickly get an entire snapshot. Uh, disaster recovery is a breeze, and uh, Redis forks off a separate process so that the backup process isn't competing with, uh, uh, with the main process servant requests. Um, it's periodic. So in between backups, anything that you've written to your Redis server, you'd lose. And uh, it, it can be slow because you're writing, a, you're writing your entire data set out. So if you got a, uh, a, you know, a Amazon instance with 17 gigs of memory and you're using nine of it to have Redis, uh, you might be writing nine gigs of data to EBS every time you want to do a snapshot. And anybody who's written to EBS can probably tell you that the throughput's about 400 kilobytes a second. So uh, writing nine gigs would take a while. Um, option two is doing uh, sort of a binary log, an append-only file. And so what it does is it appends a log of the operations that it did uh, so that uh, you can basically replay your database. Um, because of the frequent writes, you're not really going to lose any data. Um, it's smaller bursts of disk I.O., but it's slower to recover because once you bring it back up, you've got to replay the entire log in order to get your database back to its state, and the storage format is far less efficient. Um, I recommend you hire a sysadmin, because um, then there's somebody that's actually thinking about this problem and doing it right. And what we ended up doing was uh, we have a master and slave set up, and the master doesn't actually write anything to disk. Uh, the slave does, and it does a combination of doing a full backup and then appending after that, and then a full backup and appending after that. Uh, in case of the master failure, HA systems kick the master out, re-elect the slave to master, uh, the, the new master stops writing to disk, and then once we bring the other one up, it can start syncing up, start doing our backups for us. It, it's complicated, and, and even then it's not perfect, but um, uh, it's a good way to get more durability out of it, but it's not really an out-of-the-box setup. Um, it has to fit in the memory. It's an in-memory database. Uh, you cannot have a Redis database larger than your available system memory, except you can. Um, don't. Uh, you know, uh, I've seen people do it. I've seen people uh, let Redis start getting into swap. Um, and, and really, once you start hitting the disk, every single performance advantage you have from Redis is just obliterated. Um, so you can do it. Just don't. And pretend like you can't. Um, good idea to uh, run Redis on dedicated machines. Um, good idea to turn off swap on that machine. Um, good idea to, or to turn off swappiness, definitely. But um, uh, the other issue with that is that Redis doesn't release memory back to the system. It doesn't defrag its own heap. So if you put a million keys into Redis and then delete a million keys, your in-memory Redis process isn't going to be any smaller. It's going to be the same size it was when it had the million keys in there. So if you're running Redis on a machine where it's having to compete for memory with uh, other processes, Redis doesn't play nice. Uh, so again, it's a good idea to run Redis on dedicated hardware. Um, nobody likes throwing away data. Um, but you should uh, implement a key ejection strategy. When Redis is pressed for memory, you can tell it, well, what do you want me to do in this case? Do you want me to use LRU, least recently used? Do you want me to throw out the biggest keys? What do you want me to do? And uh, it, it's not a pleasant thing to think about, but it's better than the kernel going in and killing the process and you losing everything. Um, so it's a good idea to configure a, a, a key ejection strategy. Now there's a bunch of little annoying things that I can bitch about because I have a microphone. Um, you can't set expiration times on individual members of a set. So if I'm keeping a set of things, I can't expire this element at this time. I have to expire the entire set or not. So I end up writing a bunch of you know, uh, tasks in Python to, to monitor those lifetimes. Um, the Python bindings are great, but their early implementation, they accidentally inverted some of the arguments versus the Redis spec. And because they're backward compatible, they, they, that, those persist today. So for example, uh, Z add, so adding a new element to the scored set. 
arguments are inversed. Um, so that trips me up more often than I'd like. Uh, when you change the master that a slave is slaving to, so say you have two slaves and you elect a new one as the master and then the other one has to switch, um, Redis doesn't deny connections on that slave while it's catching up to the new master. It actually just grabs them and holds onto them and doesn't do anything with them until the slave has finished syncing, uh, which will hang up your entire system, and that's a lot of fun. Uh, also, Redis is a single process, so it can't take advantage of multi-core hardware. It can't take advantage of uh, anything outside of a single process, so uh, it's single CPU only. Um, that's basically it. Uh, I think I got done fairly fast, so uh, I'd, I'd love to take any questions if anybody has any. Hi, um, I'm interested in knowing why you recommend Redis for Celery and not, say, MongoDB. Um, it's easy. Uh, I mean, the, the uh, moving information with Kombu and Celery, so moving it from exchanges to queues is very fast. Uh, being able to introspect what's there is very fast. Uh, if you already have a Redis server that's running, it's very easy to simply drop Celery into it. Uh, it uh, for us, it was a simplification. Um, and, and even if you just apt get install Redis out of the box and just start running on your local machine, you don't actually have to do any configuration other than the two config lines in uh, your settings.py to get it to start using that broker. Um, it, it, it's tremendously simple, and it's a low barrier to entry. Uh, and the, uh, especially with the new Celery 3.0, uh, the, the uh, drivers for, for Redis in Celery have gotten a lot better. Um, I, I don't have any problem with using MongoDB for it, just that uh, as Redis is more designed for volatile data and for soon to be uh, ejected data, it, uh, it bears a little less overhead. And um, for performance? Yes. Better for performance. Uh, I, I don't have benchmarks for you, but given that MongoDB does strive for durability uh, in a way that Redis doesn't, I would expect that Redis would have higher performance for storing tasks in a queue to be very quickly pulled off by a worker. Thank you. So, what's the next stop for people who have clearly abused their Redis and don't want to lose their data? Um, should I go? Postgres. I mean, I could lose all my data, but and the app would keep working. But at some point, I want to think about maybe persisting some of this stuff. Um, it it depends. Um, you know, uh, uh, making it more durable by pulling what's out of REST and throwing into to SQL. It's a good idea. I mean, for I mean, uh, with, with our stats, yes, we keep the most recent copy in Redis, but it's a copy, and and the the durable version is already in the database. Um, mostly what you want to worry about is making sure that you have that very fast queryable copy. Um, so if you want to write a celery beat task or a cron job to periodically take those counts that you've got in Redis or those values you've got in Redis and serialize them out or put them into Postgres or do something to sync them to a more durable medium, you can recover from that definitely very reliably. But you want to make sure that you still have it in Redis so that you get the very quick access time. Also, what do you think of the hosting providers, and does that get you any uh, persistence that you don't have to worry about, like Redis to go? Um, I haven't used any of the uh, ASPs for Redis. Um, we're running Redis on uh, AWS right now. Uh, I can tell you that writing uh, the binary logs and the, uh, the dumps to EBS is uh, really slow, although we haven't tried it with the new fixed bandwidth EBS instances or the solid state ones. Um, but uh, ideally, you would have some fairly fast disks. And if the ASPs have done a good job at uh, uh, configuring that replication and that failover for you, that's, it's certainly a, a headache that I would consider paying money for. Thank you. Hi, I just have a question about um, just to touch on some. You, you spoke earlier about some of the performance implications of using a Redis with regard to sizing your machines. Um, and it reminded me a little bit of uh, Varnish. Uh, Varnish basically drops all your data into a huge Merrimack chunk, and whether your um, cache is running from memory or disk basically amounts to whether or not the amount of memory that you've mapped mm -hmm. is larger or smaller than RAM, and it just trusts 
the um, VM to take care of doing the LRU properly for you. And, um, and I guess my question is, with Redis, uh, because you mentioned there's no, uh, there's no garbage collection, so things only tend to, to grow. Um, and I guess my question is, from your own experience, when you do get into that situation where you've um, run out of memory and you begin paging, is what is the, yes, while the performance will suck because you're often serving from disk, how does it compare to any other solution where you're kind of expecting things to go to disk, like just using MySQL? Um, probably the best way I can answer that question is that starting in, I think, Redis 2.8, you can't, you can't go to disk. Uh, they're actually disabling the possibility of you having a data set larger than your system memory. Um, I, I think they don't want to focus efforts on making that higher performance because, uh, Again, it completely invalidates the reasons why you might want to use it. And Varnish is, uh, I, I would not necessarily recommend using Redis for the outermost cache in a Django setup. I wouldn't recommend caching entire web pages in Redis versus being able to do it with something like Varnish. Um, and Varnish will do the HTTP negotiation a hell of a lot faster. And, um, uh, and again, the larger the values that you're storing in Redis, the lower its performance ends up being. Oh yeah, I, I wasn't suggesting that Redis and Varnish were the same thing. I was just, it was yeah. the only other application I could think of where their attitude was memory swap, it's all the same thing with the operating system stored out Yes. Um, um, that's, that's why I brought it up. Redis's performance uh, really, really sucks when you're going to disk. Um, and I, Okay. Thanks. Don't do it. <laughs> like, I, it's, it's really the best advice I can give is plan ahead, get way more RAM than you think you'll ever need, and, and just don't do it. Don't let it touch the disk because it, it, it doesn't work. Hi. So uh, Redis sounds awesome. I'm a little bit concerned, of course, because of the um, issues you mentioned with memory getting larger and larger and needing to have like a sysadmin who knows the details of Redis and is kind of taking care of all of that. So I was wondering, like, for most things, it seems like memcached is enough for the, our purposes. And I was wondering, is is in terms of speed, is there some gain that we would get from moving to Redis, or is the speed pretty much comparable? And it's mostly the smartness. So if if you're using Redis only for getting and setting, if Get, set, and delete are the only three operations that you're doing. And if you don't care about uh, having any sort of say over what information is ejected from the cache, uh, I would say use memcache. Oh, we, we use both. I mean, they, they both have, uh, they're, they're both better for certain things. Their problem spaces clearly overlap. Um, but for, uh, if you're going to apply any sort of intelligent logic, you've got to use Redis. I would imagine their performance, I would imagine that memcache is faster at the simple get, set, delete operations, just because that's what it's built to do. Um, its clustering is different than Redis's clustering. Uh, uh, you can, uh, uh, the, the, the key value distribution between parallel copies of memcache is completely different from the way it is in Redis. Uh, so uh, yeah, if you're just doing get, set, delete, use memcache. It, uh, if you want anything even a little more sophisticated or you want more control over your ejection strategy, Redis is a good call. Okay. Um, on, along that vein then, are the more complicated things something that I can kind of gain by using the Redis cache backend or does the Redis ca cache backend so basically the, just... The Redis cache backend does implement the normal Django uh, cache API. So it does have the get, set, delete, get many, set many, you know, all those. Uh, it adds a few extra methods, mostly revolving around uh, cache invalidation and key ejection. Um, so you can give you can give the back end the glob that you want to delete all of the keys that match. Um, so if you have a strategy that you want to provide uh, a smarter, more timely cache invalidation, the Redis back end does give you some more flexibility and some more explicit options with regard to uh, uh, how keys are ejected. Thanks. Cool. Thank you.